I am happy to welcome uh, Dr. Crawford, professor, uh, to talk to us about his research. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Uh, you guys can all hear me okay? So it's a pleasure to be back. It's been a long time. Um, I, initially, I was going to give a talk on a different technology. It's really scientific and really nerdy, uh, but that story's not finished. It's the holiday season, and this is a better story with a better ending. So I'm going to give you a little chat about my experience on osteochondra allografts and some background. Um, and these are my disclosures. Probably most importantly is the first bullet point. Um, I'm a member of the MOCA board. I'll explain what that is. Um, it's a, supported by a nonprofit, uh, we, I'm going to say philanthropic approach. Um, uh, but OHSU received significant research support from JRF uh, for a number of multi-center trials and studies and even some basic science historically. My goals today, <clears throat> honor the gift of human donation. You know, I think sometimes it's easy to forget all that stuff that shows up, powdered bone, and all that comes from humans. And from my perspective, that represents one of the best parts of medicine. You know, this is an area where people give back, and they don't give back with significant criteria, like you can't have it if you live in that state, or you can't have it if you look like this. It's, I'm giving this to some other human. And I just wanted to bring that back. So. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the regulatory history of human tissue donation in the U.S. because it has remarkable, um, it's a good story. Um, and I think uh, to Dr. Working's point earlier, you know, just kind of follow this along until it turned into really a bunch of really good stuff. And so we'll consider the process for live or fresh osteochondral allograft tissue procurement and surgical planning because it's fairly unique in the donation world, okay, because it's not get it in in eight hours because it's a heart but it's also not we can freeze it and keep it in storage forever. And then if I have time, I'll summate my experience with this, uh, introduce you to the MOCA group and our um, uh, mission, and then the things at OHSU that have occurred uh, as a result of that, or at least some of those. And if time permits uh, a case presentation, somebody please allow me to understand when I have five or ten minutes left because I'm not paying close attention. So uh, in the United States, the driver's license, license certification for, um, at the state level. Oh, I didn't, I don't know what happened. It's just pausing now, let me change slides. Oh, okay. Um, this most in often includes a query of donation interest and codifies the intent of application as donors. Okay, and this is occurring in almost every state. And 90% uh, of donors enter the system through the DMV process. So in this slide, um, I'm trying to help you understand that this link, this carabiner, so to speak, between your patient and the surgeon is the tissue bank. Um, and it's estimated that around 2.5 million tissues were transplanted in the United States in 2022. So when I checked my box, unfortunately, I can't be an OCA donor because the age for that is now 12 years to 35 years, okay? And this is a representation of a case we'll potentially get to later where uh, allograft was used to fill this big hole in a person who was otherwise quite disabled. So the origins of tissue transplant come from organ donation, and the legal criteria of death, which is neurological death, was defined at Harvard in the, in the late 60s and adopted a decade later by most U.S. states. And this medical support that allowed perfusion after brain death really increased the, the, the potential catchment of uh, organ donation and tissue, and uh, recently there's been some concern about this. There's been some problems in New York, or uh, let's just say advocates for keeping folks alive alive longer and where the line is, but this serves as a legal uh, place so that folks like our government can start to get into the uh, business of regulating this. The Uniform Anatomic Gift and National Transportation Act was established conditions for governing do donation, and I'm really uh, flickering quite a bit here. I don't know if you guys can still see this. Um, uh, and, and that act outlawed the sale and purchase and created a national organ wait list, and that was 1984. 1985, Oregon pioneers, New York and California, required consent laws. In other words, hospitals needed to ensure that families had the opportunity to elect donation. But in 1986, the U.S. Social Security Administration required that hospitals notify families of the potential to be donors. And at around that time, there were about 200,000 tissue transplants in a year because of this sort of 
lack of input. The Organ Procurement Agency and Tissue Recovery, okay, so now the U.S. Inspector General gets involved uh, as part of the Department of Health and Human Services and the role of these OPAs in procurement for muscular skeletal tissue becomes clear that they are really dealing with musculoskeletal tissue, our domain. 60% of musculoskeletal tissue was coming from organ donors at that time. And the U.S. Public Health Service uh, was uh, charged with oversight of the OPAs with the goal to in increase tissue recovery. And they looked at this partnership with the American Association of Tissue Banks, which was pretty immature at that time. And so the uh, federal regulations continue to uh, evolve. Uh, and routine referral, uh, as I mentioned, required that hospitals not only notify families, but now notify the local procurement agency of all deaths. And they also had the charge of promoting staff training to screen potential donors and engage every donation opportunity. And this is now 10 years later, and as a result of some of these changes, the number of tissue transplants went up 2.5 times. So tissue banking and fresh out through contra allografts, because that's what I'm here to talk about. The first U.S. tissue bank facility was established a long time, you know, 50 years prior to what I was just talking about, and that was the U.S. Navy and, uh, you know, great investment from our government and military, because this served as a template uh, for a program in Toronto. And that program in Toronto stems from their oncology program. Um, and Alan Gross, who was there, did the first fresh osteochondral allograft for trauma to the knee by fundamentally working with his oncology colleagues and harvesting on the same day in the same OR from a deceased patient that day and bringing it to another OR where a patient had been prepared to receive an allograft in the knee. And Alan's work is historic. And in the, in the 80s, there were only three programs like this in North America, one at UC San Diego, Allen's in Toronto, and one in Miami. And not until the turn of the um, century were these programs starting to become more common. And Allosource and Joint Restoration Foundation became GeoF Ortho around this time. I'll talk about them specifically, but there are other uh, resources and entities that do this. Just keep in mind that my story is most familiar with the folks at uh, JRF. Um, and also, the FDA got involved. And why is that important? Well, they began to regulate tissue banking with an, a focus on infectious disease, donor screening, and records. That was the 90s. Um, and they established uh, an organization which I would compel many of you interested in research to be familiar with, uh, the Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research. They're charged with the oversight of all products derived from human tissues and cells. So in 2001, they required the registration and listing of all entities that manage such tissue. And in 2004, established eligibility criteria for donors and good tissue practices, including inspection and enforcement. So if you wanted to run a tissue bank, you had to basically respond to the FDA and specifically Steber. So what are some of the characteristics of fresh osteochondral allograft that make it unique in this domain, right? It has live chondrocytes. So it's living graft tissue. Okay, and that is thought to convey biological benefits. Okay, we know from um, uh, recovery specimens uh, that there are preserved chondrocyte viability. Um, in uh, animal studies, it's been shown that the proteoglycan activity of this transplanted tissue uh, continues to be viable. And in studies actually that we did here, we showed that in humans, up to two years after the um, transplant, that using MRIs, that the cartilage remained uh, biologically active. Um, so chondrocyte preservation requires a unique processing and distribution. It requires specialized facilities. It requires really busy slides that give you the strobe effect, and I apologize for that. Um, so, uh, and as a result, there's a timeline for, to availability for surgery that on the minimal side requires that we assess for the risk of infection. So there's a minimal amount of time we have to wait and then on the viability side, there's sort of an expiration time, which can range from 28 days, which is what I choose in my practice, up to 56 days. So the safety fundamental principle of practice, donor selection, the, that's pretty much the screening. And I would tell you that the people that do that are unbelievable humans. They go to the bedside. They talk to families when young people die, and they ask them really hard questions, because that's the number one thing. And I would tell you those people are awesome. Um, 
we have to look at the presumed cause of death. There may or may not be an autopsy, and then there's screening for emergent viruses and, and the things like uh, CJD. Uh, that's done basically by history. Uh, interviews, and there are exclusion criteria, we won't get into the details, and then there are some serological uh, requirements. Um, and then the clean room processing requires uh, ISO level four. Now, are you all familiar with ISO levels for, for clean rooms and ORs? So it basically has to do with how often the air goes through the room to keep particles out, okay? And it has to be unidirectional, so you know that, right? You walk into an OR and the, and the air hopefully is moving out of the room. But like, and it's a state regulated thing and, and the requirement's around five times an hour, okay? So for an ISO 4 exchange, it's 500 times an hour. And that's to keep particles of certain sizes down, right? So it's just a clean room. So the, the Intel and those chips that are in all these machines are built in rooms, I think they're ISO like three, okay? Crazy that this is four, it's less. All right, anyway, and microbial cultures are currently done by culturing Unfortunately, we still haven't gotten nucleic acid testing as a standard because that would expedite the minimal process, right? Right now we have to wait for something to grow to say it's safe, and nucleic acid tests could potentially tell us in days or hours or day. All right, so if you wanna build, if you wanna run a tissue bank, an organ procurement agency, this is the guidelines that you would use. The first standards were established in 1984. The current 14th edition is a comprehensive Transplant Tissue Practice Encyclopedia. It is the gold standard and it has everything from like how to test to how to build a facility to care for these. And I would tell you my initial involvement with some of these agents was literally going and doing a white glove test on these places to see that it looked like what I thought was safe to tell my patients is safe. So this is an example of grass processing in the 28 day timeline. I, again, 28 days is my selection, it's the shortest amount of time that we can sort of use because we think that the chondrocyte viability uh, is important for this process. In 28 days, the chondrocyte viability really starts to drop off to less than 50%. I don't know, Kenny, what do you think? I'm on it, but this is why we usually don't use other computers. I understand. And hopefully, Thank you. If you invite me back, I will do my best to download this to this shared site. Um, so the recovery and preservation of viable articular surface, it's an aseptic excision within 24 hours of asystole. There's no sterilization process here. I want you to understand that. You cannot put this under things that would kill the cells. The majority of this occurs in the OPA OR, okay, the procurement. OR. It used to occur in the ORs of the hospitals, but that's really, there's no room for that anymore. <laughs> okay? End blocking scission of the uh, knee and ankle would occur so that the biological, the capsule would be preserved as a, basically a biological dressing. In hips and uh, uh, proximal humerus, we don't take the acetabulum, we don't take the scapula. Typically, there's a slightly higher risk of contamination there because of the proximity to bacteria. Um, exposed cartilage surfaces, like from a, a, a hip or a proximal humerus, are wrapped in a nutrient media soaked sponge, and these are shipped to the processor lab overnight by courier on wet ice. The processing to a therapeutic FOCA deliverable, the thing that we get in that package in the OR that the nurse asked me to open, uh, uh, has to be in the recovery uh, in less than 48 hours. Again, this is a class four ISO room. Visual tissue inspection for quality, just looking at it, is it actually something we can use? and then shaping it into the final surgical graft uh, product, I guess. Is that okay to say? These are the products, okay? In the knee, you can get a hemicondyle, a partial condyle, a distal femur, a patella trochlea, even a matched set, a tibial plateau, plus or minus meniscus, and you can get stuff from other joints that people are also interested in. The basic culture testing is a, uh, the swab method, which was, was used for uh, years, has been abandoned. Why? Because it was only 90% sensitive and 90% negative predictive value. That wasn't good enough. Membrane fluid extraction, where fundamentally you pour media over this and you extract that and grow that, shows a much higher negative predictive value. So the preliminary results are obtained in day seven. So if I have an order in for a graft, I will hear preliminarily that it looks like we have tissue. And then I get a final a week later. That gives me a window of about 14 days. 
Okay, so if there's uh, no growth preliminarily, I have a 94% chance that I can schedule my surgery, but um, uh, we have to have negative growth at day 14 or else we start over. How do we match the donor, the patient, the surgical plan? This is based on defect type and general location, okay? Uh, how, how are we going to imagine doing the surgery? Is it going to be a dowel? Is it going to be a, a biouni? I'll talk about what that is. Is it going to be an M block, like the whole hemicondyle, which is more common in oncology process? And then the implant window, um, I, they, I can now give them a surgical day because of my familiarity with the system, and they can tell me with, because it's based on, you know, thousands and thousands of these, the chance is 99% that I'm going to get it. Uh, I tell them a day, but sometimes they ask for a day range, and sometimes it's first available. They just get a graft to somebody and then you scramble to find an OR. That doesn't work out great, okay? And it's all done electronically, um, and I'll share with you some of that. The release criteria are done after another review of the medical record and a review of the social history, questions about the hospital chart and the cause of death and any other available medical records. There is a lot of work that goes into getting these, okay? Full review of a recovery and process chain of custody is super important, right? That the the piece of tissue that I'm getting is actually from who we think it is. The, the culture results are confirmed. And then 30%, okay, imagine a business that 30% of your products were thrown out because of safety or quality issues that come up in the history or due to it's day 28 and now they throw it away. And so the, the FOCA expiration does vary among processes and there's other research looking at the media that we can use, the storage conditions, and some people feel that 50 plus days is okay. I still am not convinced. Um, we can, we're not here to talk about that science today. Um, but on day 28, I can't go and tell Tracy, you know, day 29, we're just gonna do this tomorrow. Okay, that would violate the standard of care. Um, if I'm using the pre-cut dowels, okay, and these are cores taken at the processing center, and pre-cut, and we'll use those increasingly for two reasons. One, they're more readily available, and two, I can keep them on the shelf to the next week and potentially use them, okay? And I'm using them more, they're less expensive, that's good, okay? And they seem to be, we don't have all the data yet, equally effective um, in terms of, uh, compared to historical, cutting it at in the OR versus cutting it in the tissue bank. And we'll talk about that. So there's some real, you know, logistical challenges to having a two-week window for surgery. You know, some hospital systems require that you book your surgery more than two weeks in advance. And if you have a two-week window, that can present some problems. Um, but now we have a system where you can pre-schedule your surgery, but that's a really close cooperation between the surgeon and the processor. And, you know, we actually pioneered that here, uh, thanks to lots of amazing people. So when I first got into this business a couple decades ago, the distribution of uh, tissue was based on geographic region. In other words, if I had donors in the Pacific Northwest, they could bring the graft back, okay? And, and then the military had special rules because that's the military. And then that evolved to priority regions and then no regional priority. I'm sorry to annoy you. Um, fortunately, and, and, and as a result, the, the, the column on the, your right, which you hopefully will see again in a moment, um, shows my experience. So when I first started doing this in 03, the wait time for a graph was six months. I did about five cases a year on average in that time period. As we improved our processes, the, the, the wait time went down for medial condyle. Uh, didn't go down for medial condyle, but went down for lateral condyle. We can talk about that later if you're interested. I could do more cases as the wait time went down, got it down to two months, did more cases, got it down to on-demand scheduling, 40 to 50 cases a year, pre-cut plugs, I'm doing one or two of these a week. Right? You guys see this as if it's routine, standard of care. It's still a little atypical, but we've gotten it to the place where it's pretty routine. How? Well, uh, this nonprofit was formed. It's the Fresh Graft Focus Tissue Processor 2001 Aloe Source, which you all know they, they provide tons of bone and all sorts of great stuff. They worked with some folks, Bill Bugby in particular at UCSD. They formed this subsidiary, JRF, JRF and that was specifically managed the fresh graft program. They worked with uh, Brian Cole and Arthrex to build the, the trays that you guys now know to make this easy because before we were cutting it by hand just like the old total joints and putting it in and it took hours and it was frustrating. And then uh, I got involved by partnering JRF with Community Tissue Services and people I knew through 
other research and created the joint JRF ortho was created in 2004. And so around the same time, um, you know, I thought uh, Mark Saffron was my mentor at UCSF and now he's at Stanford. Uh, we wrote uh, a review on osteochondritis discans because we felt it was an unsolved problem. You know, kids poorly understood, should you, you know, kids were still at the time I was a fellow getting casts for months and I was like, that's not right. We know that joint health is improved, cartilage health is improved by motion and weight bearing. You put somebody in a cast, you don't move them, you don't weight bear them, that's bad. But that was the standard, okay? And then Pete Trafton, who um, was my fellowship director uh, in trauma, if you want to call my, my penalty year at Brown a fellowship, um, Pete would say, weight bear, weight bear, weight bear, weight bear, weight bear. If it's stable, weight bear. And I was like, yeah, okay, weight bear. I've got it, Pete. All right. Can I move on to sports now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, and so about this time, uh, Bill and Brian and myself um, went to JRF and said, hey, we want to get a think tank together. And so they agreed, and they support now still to this day the MOCA uh, 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 study group. And our mission statement will hopefully appear soon while I'm sharing. Uh, but it was to review the clinical guidelines because they were guidelines. And remember, there's only a couple of hundred of these being done a year. This is not like tens of thousands of joints or you know, and um, we wanted to update and educate folks on that, and I'll show you some evidence of that. We had a goal of increasing the availability both within the United States and internationally, and we wanted to create research support. In other words, they, these nonprofits generate money. They can't give it back to shareholders. Let's give it back to interested parties like researchers and institutions doing research. And so we wanted to establish a database as the first thing. And so we did establish a database in 2018 we standardized the collection mechanics for the data, baseline scores, temporal PROs, how often to measure that, and believe me, that was no easy task to get the people at all these different institutions uh, to agree on what metrics they wanted to use and how often to collect them. But now, you know, uh, we have about half of the patients I've ever done here in that database, and there's about 2,200 in the database. Currently, we're adding at a rate of about 10 a month, and so our hope is to get 100 a month as we you know, get more of the people involved uh, into being comfortable sharing their data. Hard thing to do. To the education point, the focus of our early meetings was to create a statement on clinical issues. And ultimately using a Delphi consensus method, which is an exercise in arguing, um, but fundamentally the best way to arrive at a consensus, at least as far as I can tell, please educate me, and we were able to publish one um, manuscript on the use of this tissue uh, in the knee in general, and then another specific to the patellofemoral joint with help from some of the mentors, uh, Dr. Brady and others. And fundamentally, there's a busy slide, but I think the thing to focus on here is we looked at indications, surgical technique, graft, matching, and rehabilitation as sort of the broad areas of what do we need, how do we need to think about this thing? It's different. And one of the things we learned was it was really hard to get this authorized for insurance. And my experience in Oregon was different than Brian's experience in, 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 um, in Illinois. And, that, and it turns out because Blue Cross is 50 different companies. And it has, as we published, 50 different ways of thinking about this. They're not spectacularly different, but different enough that my note that said the defect was X size wasn't good enough in Oregon, but it might be good enough in California. And so we looked at all these different things. These are all the different things that they had listed like to qualify for surgery, right? Like all these different statements. That's just for the defect characteristic. And then we said, did we agree with it or not? And then we came up with position statements and we are using those to sort of try to make more consistent the criteria. Back here. All right, anyway, so there's defect characteristics, joint health and stability, like we don't do this in patients with inflammatory arthropathy because they destroy cartilage. Patient selection criteria, patient history criteria, and then other stuff about other joints. And, uh, uh, and, and some of my colleagues uh, helped us understand some of the targets for where we could focus our work, right? Because if we're going to convince payers, we have to have data. And so one of the things that became interesting to me is uh, I turned older, not only too old to become a donor, but too old to receive a donation, was like, hey, wait a minute, time out. 
you know, I'm watching football this weekend a little bit, and the healthiest person on the field is Pete Carroll, he's 72. Right? He looks great. He, if he had a cartilage injury that I could fix, I would want to give it to him, but most of the criteria would say, no, Pete can't have it. Why? Because he's too old. We can't use age. We need to use physiological health, right? So anyway, we, we, we set out to look at the spectrum here, and, and, and you know, my colleagues in Europe who don't, almost didn't, well, didn't have technology, they were saying, we, we really need some of the better stuff for osteochondritis. And I was like, you do. We're going to help you get that as part of our diaspora to get this to the world. But myself and some others, and then Brian Cole's group and, and, and uh, Riley Williams' group, we all published at the same time about the efficacy of this in patients older than 40. And why do we pick 40? Because half my patients were under 40 and half over, and that created a nice internal control. And what we found was that fundamentally patients did better, right, in both groups, equally better. And interestingly, their quality of life, I want you to look at the numbers here. This is a crummy quality of life. That's not awesome, but it's a lot better. And that changed the most. Okay? If you look at the other things, pain change, sports change, they all got better. But the thing that changed most is quality of life, and I like that. It's a nice thing to tell patients. And then when we looked, it didn't matter how old you were. It kind of got better longer, of course. A lot of the people in the over 40 group are dying here, but that's besides the point. You know, um, their joint wasn't the reason for their loss of quality of life, or at least we predicted that. Many residents have suffered with me doing research, and this is one of the earlier publications. It's the first time we had a little database here, back when that wasn't a thing. Um, and we published um, our, using that data set. Um, we used CAT scan, which nobody was doing, uh, which I thought was a clever way to look. That's Pete Trafton, thank you. Trauma taught me to look at CAT scans. Everybody's looking at MRIs. An MRI after one of these looks like a bomb went off. And so now patients will get a report on an MRI report, and they're doing fantastic. They look at the MRI report, and they're depressed. So I don't do that unless there's some true problem. Okay? But um, we looked at contained lesions, and we allowed them to weight bear because it was like a stable fracture construct. And so we reported on that, and these contained lesions and the patients that had them had uh, much improved PROs, consistent with historical controls. We didn't do a control group. Um, and their improvements were better for small injuries, small plugs, and the multiple plugs, like adjacent plugs, the snowman or the MasterCard, the Olympic rings, they didn't do as well. They didn't have great integration at the interface of the two plugs, right? Because it turns out that bone isn't as healthy. It's good. This gives me a chance to pause. Right? I'm going to look at it as a positive. And the weight bearing, at least initially, showed no apparent detriment to healing. I mentioned the less relative incorporation. And so this led us to think, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing plugs. And Matt Preventure, who actually visited here in 2005 as a fellow with the AOSSM, stayed at my house, went from his fellowship to Harvard. He was the doctor for Tom Brady and those guys and is now in uh, uh, Dale. Brilliant guy, shoulder surgeon, however, despite being a brilliant person. Um, and he got really interested in using uh, allografts for the glenoid and subsequently for using this thing called the bio uni to cut an oval shape and put it into defects like this, where you had impaction fractures uh, in that joint. And I said, you know, Matt, we, we've been doing this. You know, I mean, Lauren Black was way ahead, of, way ahead. Of. We published on uh, an engaging reverse Hill Sachs lesion and just a case report and, and using that instead of a replicage to stabilize the joint. And then more recently, one of the uh, medical students um, showed that, or helped me with the case report on using this for avascular necrosis, which turns out had never been reported in the literature, ever. And so we did that. And that, that's really cool, right? But Matt was now using it for the humeral head and making it easier to do this. And I think we have a case like that coming up. We got interested in uh, imaging and, and showing how the cartilage was. I mentioned this paper uh, with Dr. Brown, uh, where we showed that the cartilage remains viable. And the, one of the unique findings there was that the health of the cartilage, at least according to these uh, metrics, was analogous to the health of the surrounding cartilage. In other words, if the cartilage, if you picked a healthy patient with good cartilage, the transplant cartilage remained at that level of health. If I picked a bad patient with more arthritis, the environment forced the allograft to be more arthritic. And then uh, Devin Anderson, who's uh, at Duke now and on his way to be an attending in Vermont, um, helped with a paper where we started to use CAT scans and quantify healing and tried to correlate that with PROs. We, ha we aren't there yet, which is why it was published in OJSM, not AJSM. All right, but we're working on that with the folks at uh, UCSD and um, others. 
Uh, Sam Walton, uh, many of you are familiar with Sam's research. He presented it as often as you all are required over the years. But that stems from this problem. I, we get a Hemi condyle to make a plug about 20 millimeters. And then I would send this to Dr. Johnstone's lab, and he would do all the clever things he does with that. But I was like, this is killing me. I could take this to the back table and input pictures of this, but I could keep cutting this and come up with two or three more of those plugs. And I was like, no, that's not good enough. We're throwing that out, and we're actually now reaching a ceiling where we don't have enough graphs to go around. All right? You all haven't experienced that in our practice, but frequently, particularly low-volume users are being told there is no graph today because we, you know, this technology is getting there. And so we looked at, um, we found a company in Europe, and we said, can we predict the lesion size so I can ask for a specific pre-cut plug size rather than the standard one, the standard one 60 millimeters, but could I get a 20 or a 24 or 28? And the answer is maybe, all right? <sighs> Turns out that on the smaller side lesion, surgeons tended to go bigger, and this confounded our data. So we have to retool this research. But the idea is to improve the, 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 um, the yield. We also looked uh, with Carly and, um, and Brian as well at um, some of the things that people did after surgery. Again, we surveyed everybody that used uh, analographs uh, back in, I think, 2015, published a couple of years later. Um, and the majority of the OCA, used, OCA surgeons limited weight bearing. Why? Because this technology stems from oncology, big graphs, unhealthy patients, incorporation was slow, okay? But one of the interesting findings from this survey was that the more experienced higher volume surgeons tended towards more rapid rehab, okay? Not surprising, right? You get a little more risk, a little less risk averse. You're, you're more comfortable taking a risk as you mature in your practice and identify patients who maybe could go faster. So we are about to receive publication authorization for the first query of the MOCA database. We looked back, we worked with uh, Rush, we found 38 patients from OHSU who did immediate weight bearing in a matched cohort. I'm not going to get into the data. That's not today's purpose. But fundamentally, we found that immediate weight bearing was not inferior to traditional rehab. In other words, it's safe and effective and equally. And we didn't look at things that I think are important, like return to work and return to sports. Because if I can show, I think for sure we're going to show that if you start weight bearing on day one versus day, I don't know, 28, you're going to do better. Less atrophy, less stiffness, all those things that we know. And so we're setting up to do a prospective multi-center study through MOCA to look at this. And, and that's funded, and I'm excited to do that. It's, again, a huge project, but we're going to do it. Back to when we use these. How am I doing on time? Good. Okay. So fondamentally, the, the classic indication is osteochondritis, right? A hole in the bone, typically young people. We also use it for post-traumatic osteochondral fractures. Here, you know, we see those. And, and, and I'm happy to help and, you know, a great... Lots of patients we've helped who've had these things. You guys put the axis together, but the joint isn't looking so great. Sometimes we can help with that. Um, focal osteoarthritis. Increasingly, patients, their joint looks okay in x-ray. They get an MRI. They have a hole in their middle of their condyle. It's early arthritis. It hasn't spread. We can really help them. That's why I really feel it's important not to look at their age, but look at their indication. Osteonecrosis, you know, cancer centers see lots of that. And then failed cartilage repair, a prior microfracture, all the other things. It's a great rescue technology. It has to be a certain size because we don't feel like really small cartilage lesions are typically symptomatic. Uh, so some subchondral bone loss or disease, and then no inflammatory arthropathy, no environment that's going to eat your cartilage. Okay? Can't be a candidate for traditional arthroplasty, you know, two, three compartment arthritis. Requires that you balance the joint, stable joint, you know, correct the axis if you need to, those type of things. So here are a few cases, and then we'll open up for discussion. But the classic indication is lateral uh, medial femoral condyle, osteochondral graft, where you can press fit. You take that cylinder and you just push it into the hole. That does well. That's kind of where all this came from. But these uncontained lesions are a problem, and I'll show you a couple examples of that. And then I, I'll show you an example of this older patient without arthritis, and then some post-traumatic examples just to give you the flavor of what we're doing and to stimulate discussion potentially. So here's a classic, you know, bilateral, lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. Uh, the conundrum here, and I think I've talked to some of you about this historically, is this person came to me after multiple surgeries with someone else. They tried to drill it. They tried to fix it. 
They tried to do a bunch of other things. Ultimately, they took the piece out of one of those knees, and it was all. And I get the referral. And of course, they have this problem in the other knee, okay? So they have mild pain in the other knee. No pain in the knee they referred for reconstruction. Do you operate on someone with no pain? I don't know. I didn't. Why? Because this is going to trash things, right? It's a huge hole. This is going to grow. We know that from studies. And so I treat this because it's a disease in evolution that you can potentially arrest. And here's the early CAT scan, and it, you know, incorporated. It looks pretty good. And that person ultimately went on to have it on both sides. But that's a hard discussion, right? Like the, the family doesn't have any idea where they why are we talking about the right knee? It doesn't hurt. That was taken care of. They threw the piece out. It's the left knee. And I'm like, well, yeah, we can talk about that. So here's a different flavor of the osteoarthritis chondritis. Cyst. That is a big problem, right? There's like no condyle. It's the world's biggest half of, I think it's a half of fracture. You guys still call it that? Yeah, right. It's gone, right? Well, it's actually not gone. It's just being pulverized here. And, you know, and it's, you could try to put it back if you got it early and if you felt that this was alive. Okay, there are some indicators there, like when the, when the bone is basically different shades, but, you know, it's fragmented and there's no way I can fix that. And if I fix that with a hole here, I'd still have a problem. So we use the BioUni technique, and, um, you know, you can see it really came together pretty nicely, heals pretty well. We did use compression fixation because there's just no way to, to keep that in a hole, right? This is a slightly different one, slightly older patient, slightly further posterior uh, injury, like he has no back, and I couldn't get there. You know, the problem with this technology is, unlike a lot of surgeries, you can kind of come in at an angle. Can't come in at an angle. And I was like, well, I have to do this really great thing that's super fun for me and terrible for you, is I have to take off your, you know, tuberosity, like you do for sometimes to get access. But, you know, that's a hard thing to do electively sometimes. And it worked out okay. Um, and you know, I learned about rehab after TTOs then. Here's my older patient. If you look at this x-ray, you don't really see any arthritis. In fact, you don't see much. I think I remember that the primary referring him gave this person a hard time about the MRI. Well, like, yep. Turns out he said meniscus, and so, of course, that's what you have. And didn't have a meniscus there. Meniscus looks pretty well. It actually had been previously removed. So this is a classic sequelae of that, right? That's 22 years he gained, maybe 20. And now he has a cartilage tear, and the bone underneath it is becoming cystic. And the evidence for how much disease is in that bone is from how deep this plug is. You know, that's probably 8 or 10 millimeters, which is about twice as deep as I want to go. Okay? Our guidelines, if you ever worked on the service, that original paper I showed, the MOCA guidelines, talks about we don't really love to go this deep because the healing that occurs here is thought to be creeping substitution, and the less creeping, the quicker the healing. Okay? To keep it simple. Um, oh, yeah, uh, Dr. Brady sends me some of these sometimes because she gets a referral for a patellar dislocation. You can probably guess which side dislocated. Lots of debris in there. Somebody else went in and threw it all out, told them they'd be fine. They weren't fine. The patellar apex is missing. Fragmented, broken, it's not going to stay in, not because of the ligament, but because of the congruence of the bone and the architecture, right? So we went in and we restored the apex. Interestingly, the patella heals very differently. It's a different bone, okay? It's not, it may be that it's not weight bearing, okay? Uh, and, the, and there was some good deal here, but you can see the cysts. We're looking at that with the folks at um, Rush to see if there are things we can do to make those cysts go away. We haven't correlated that yet with outcomes, but I suspect that if we look out longer, those with cysts won't last as long. Uh, and here's one I'm, I'm getting more interested in because we see this. This is a person, 40-year-old person, who had a hyperextension ACL tear. So it's a little different, right? We're used to the valgus load rotation, okay? Um, yeah, and how do I tell it's a hyperextension? Because it's an avulsion from the tibia side, right? Most of the ACLs we see are up here, right? And so as, as a result, impact, right? Gets this impaction fracture, and if I just fix the ACL, he's going to keep falling into that hole, and that ACL is going to fail for sure. So we did a concurrent surgical care. I've done about 27 of these. Really interested in looking at this and reporting this, because I suspect they do equally well to patients with a standard ACL. My, I, I, and I, I don't know how to design a trial where I don't fix those. 
and there aren't enough to really do it, but it's just something we're doing more of, and it's a possible non-inferiority trial versus ACLs without osteochondrolograss. So in conclusion, um, some thoughts and a dedication because it's important uh, to reflect. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do this, to be here, and to lead. It's been awesome. I would tell you, amazing. The people I've met, some of those people here. Um, and I, I'd always go back to some of the brainwashing that occurred to me in med school, and you know, I'm learning about other disciplines. And Louis Pasteur said something. You might remember him. He discovered vaccines, which have been important of late. He discovered, oh, some other things. Okay, pretty smart person. He said, chance favors a prepared mind. So you know, these early morning meetings are valuable. Okay. And then he also said, go to observers. Who are the observers? Because you know, um, Mendel. He was also a scientist. He created genetics, I believe, was this field he discovered, was not doing prospective randomized clinical trials. Observational studies and, and setting up tests to look and observe and see what happened, okay? And, and, and when you have small numbers, which is often the case in the niches of problems in medicine, at least initially, you have to observe first. And when you do partner with friends and like-minded people, some of them are represented here. This is Bill Bugby. Uh, he's like the godfather. I visited with him for a week when I was a fellow in San Francisco, went down to San Diego and was like, wait, you're a joint surgeon. What am I doing here? And just a smart guy and a scientist and has published tons on the science of this. And if you want to know about cartilage health and, and broth and media, he's the person to read him and Bob Saad down it and, and builds out scripts because he has an office. It's like the nicest office in the world. I looks at the of this is um, Tim Spaulding is uh, in, in London and Tim Tim has brought this program here, and we like to remind Tim that he gets our leftovers, and he likes to remind us that we get his leftovers in the soccer pitch. Um, that, this is Luis Trico, who is just an unbelievable human. He's in, he's in, um, he's in Brazil, and, 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 and basically Luis uh, is, did and is doing, and finally now we have a pathway to him. Uh, he was doing what was done in Toronto 50 years ago. He was doing it. I mean, he had a refrigerator in his office, right? Um, and then Christian, uh, you know, Christian passed away in October. It's very sad. He's a CEO, and he supported all this. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Brady gave a great talk on, on why to be careful in partnering with industry. And it's true. There's a lot of sharks out there. But there are also a lot of really amazing people. And so my, my thought is, um, you know, do that. And so hopefully, hopefully, all of this torture. Hey, guys. My name is Hannah. I recently this was a massive procedure to get approval for, so I'm so grateful that we pushed through and I can sit here now and tell you that the surgery was a massive success. I'm still doing extensive rehabilitation and physio in order to regain strength from my legs, hopefully again. I'm so thankful that in the near future I will be able to return to netball and basketball just like I used to. I'm so thankful for my donor family. To their grief, pain and loss, they were able to restore hope to me here in Australia. It gives me a second chance to get my legs fixed. I've had nine operations on my legs so far, and even though many said this operation could be performed here in Australia, we proved them wrong. We proved them that a positive attitude, lots of determination, and a wonderful team of dedicated staff are all around the world for anything is possible. Never underestimate the power and the ability that tissue and organ donation can do to one's life. I'm just one example of the way it has changed my life, and I'm sure there are thousands of others. Thank you so much for all your work, help, and dedication along the way. Good day, guys. Well, well, these are some things. So that's great, right? And I should add Australia to the list of places that U.S. tissue donation has benefited. And they're, like other places um, around the globe, billing systems like we have, but the regulations are crazy, and I've learned a lot. These are a list of publications related to FOCA just from our group. Um, and I wanted to just say thanks and for the opportunity. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them. That's it. <laughs> Nothing. Yes, I got a question. Oh yeah. So we, the, you know, the weight bearing question, I think, is a fascinating one for a lot of relevance to many different parts of the solution. Right. So, and so I was particularly interested in that study setup which is such a hard thing to research because they're both short-term outcomes and long-term outcomes. I'm curious about it to what kind of the consequences of loading tissue might be 
Right. Are you guys sort of looking at like differential pros is interesting? Are you guys also looking at radio traffic outcomes in those patients? Yeah. So Adam Yankee's at Rush, and Adam and his cohort served as a control group for our group. He still does a fairly traditional rehab program, and he wants to. We're establishing the guidelines for the prospective study. We're recruiting other centers. And although I don't think any one of the members who will participate is comfortable with the idea of randomizing, my practice is too well established. I think it would be confusing. And I actually think it's okay because we have data out to a couple years uh, to keep weight bearing. But we are going to look at CT and MRI. I really don't want to look at MRI, it's going to be a headache. Um, but uh, I think sequential CT is relatively inexpensive to, to be supported annually, maybe semi, you know, every other year. Uh, and some of the data from Rush in a different study I didn't mention is suggesting that when they don't weight bear the patients, maybe there are less cysts. So maybe there is some micromotion. We haven't standardized across the containment, the location. That, you know, we're talking about small numbers still, but the hope is we set up a prospective study with several hundred patients in each group, and we can then micro dissect. You know lateral versus lateral, medial versus medial, BMI match, gender match. You know, a study out of New York suggests that maybe we have to be a little more careful with matching a gender, uh, you know, because we don't match for uh, any type of antigens. Um, I don't agree with the data, uh, all due respect to them, uh, because I think it's, again, their conclusion is a little um, uh, timely versus scientifically based. Other data from Bill's lab suggests that the gender isn't an issue in the, in the matching, but we're looking at all that stuff. And I, I think you're right. I think getting um, an objective measure, if we can, we're also working with UC San Diego right now to, to standardize the CAT scan uh, metric so we can have uh, you know, a, a ruler that's universally applied. And that, that's going to be from about, 2000, from about 2,000 patients, hopefully. We're, we're, we're about halfway there. Okay. You were talking a little bit beforehand, you know, it's amazing to see kind of like career, you know, everything that you've accomplished, you know, a worldwide like leader in thought in Carlos' work and the body of work you've accomplished. And we have a lot of residents who are both interested in academic and non-academic careers. You know, what there are one or two pieces of advice for somebody who's like undertaking, you know, an area of inquiry, whether it's clinical or research, um, that like wish you would have known a couple of years back. Huh. Or things that you thought you did know and turned out to be correct and, and yeah. you'd like to pass on. Well, thank you, first of all. Um, number one is be a turtle. All right, I was a hare. Go, baby, go. This stuff takes time. Don't get discouraged. Keep your path. Move forward. You're going to run into some massive roadblocks, okay? I told you I was going to give a talk on something different. When I first started, it turns out there's some roadblocks I did not anticipate. And as a result, I want to wait to tell that story so I can teach you about those roadblocks. So I'd say that. And then just find something that you find. you got to love it. You know, um, I'm really fortunate. My um, daughter uh, is enjoying music. We've introduced her to the piano. And I was chatting with my wife about this. Why did we do that? The chances that she becomes a concert piano compensator for this are small. And the chances that we have a, um, a conflict based on my desire for her to practice and her desire to practice are high. So what's the goal? <laughs> you know, the goal is to find, to give something that you love, because if you love it, you will do it. And so in your domain, if you can find something that you truly enjoy, and like-minded people, because I really like spending time with the people I showed you. I just, it's, it's the benefit. It's the thing I miss the most in the pandemic. I couldn't spend time with them. And so if you find those people, you will gravitate to it, and it will make the work easier, and then being a turtle isn't so painful, if that can be uh, reasonable advice. Yeah. And plus, you live a lot longer than a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> All right? I'll leave you with that. If there's any questions from the people who I can't see, probably not. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.